Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking to Bishop Polmeyer. That's right. We're talking with Bishop Eric Polmeyer of the Diocese of St. Augustine and Father Rich's Bishop. So we're going to get all the inside story mm -hmm. of his charism, of his ministry, and what he thinks of his new priest that works under him. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to be on my best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were wearing a jacket when Jimmy Aiken was on. And now you're <laughs> Bishop, thanks for joining us today. Really excited about this conversation. We've got Father Rich's file oh, here. Lord, I and Father Rich is now wearing a jacket. <laughs> are, you, uh, are you still got parking right. in uh, handicapped spaces at your parish? Um, I changed it to the pastor's parking. I thought that was okay. I reviewed the ratio. We had enough. We had enough. So you don't think people need toilet paper either? I, I don't understand. Uh, I'm really excited to get this, uh, this going today. It says you request gluten, vegan-free meals at every house blessing. It's a bit much. I, I have allergies. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is really great. So we have a, a bishop on our show, which is yeah. a, quite an honor. And then also, you know, to understand, you know, a little bit more about you and what your mission in the church is and what it's like now as the bishop of the Diocese of St. Augustine, which we are so blessed to be in. Yeah. And with your grace, we're allowed to be here because, you know, we're not from here. So we got to be on our best behavior, too, because yeah. he could say... Don't come past the county line, right? Well, you you guys, you don't live here, so you do travel in. But really, Delacross is one of the faithful sons of Bishop's diocese. That's right. So, okay. That's mean. right. And I think a thank you's in order because <laughs> for loaning him out for a few days to record here, it's been uh, really a blessing to see his pastoral ministry develop and to see him develop as a priest. And then uh, also, you know, our friendship, yep. you know, mm -hmm. over the past five years have been really blessing. exciting. Yeah, it is. That's very cool. And it's a blessing to have you connect with us today so we can introduce my bishop. And uh, it's been a joy for me, uh, Bishop, you know, getting to know you, getting to know your family, and to be a part of your ordination. I've never been a part of an ordination. I've never attended an ordination of a bishop. And it was one of the most impressive things I've ever experienced in my life and very, very moving. Yeah. It's interesting. It, of course, it was very powerful for me, and and uh, the ordination of a bishop follows prior ordination of a, being ordained a deacon, and then as a priest. And so I had the opportunity to kind of compare the experiences. And I think one of the biggest differences being ordained a bishop is that it was less uh, stressful in the sense I was less nervous about what comes next. Because mm -hmm. as a new priest, you know, the next day you're celebrating mass for the first time. So. Mm -hmm. It's in your head not to mess that up. You're trying to make sure the books are in order. You're just trying to do things right. And um, following the ordination of a bishop, my the next event was mass at the cathedral, but I've celebrated mass for 24 years now. So there wasn't any concern about how to do it. I could really focus on the moment, on taking in what I was receiving in that moment, as well as the opportunity to speak for the first time, to address people that I, that I know I'll be spending mm -hmm. years and years of my life with. So mm -hmm. did you, uh, I know, I noticed when bishops celebrate mass, they would take their zucchetta off sometimes and then they put their <laughs> miter down and then, you know, there's a lot. Did yeah, you, so right. you were worried about get, not no, getting so, that? See, I used to be an MC, but so, <laughs> okay. uh, and I, okay. I had to do that. I had to do that for other bishops. Yeah. Uh, you were like uh, telling uh, them, yeah. okay, now's the time of course, to take it you know, off. Father Tom Willis was right there to make mm -hmm. sure everything was yeah. in order in that regard. Good. So, Good. Before coming and be, being ordained the bishop of St. Augustine, where, where were you from? Where were you born? Uh, where were you ordained a priest? You know, how did you, how did this road lead you to here? So I was raised in a, a very Catholic family in a small town in Arkansas, which doesn't have many Catholics. It's something like 4% of the population is all mm -hmm. uh, in Arkansas. But I lived in the most Catholic part. Uh, there's a Benedictine monastery there and a lot of German immigrants in the Arkansas River Valley. In fact, unfortunately, the monastery made the news a couple of weeks ago as someone attacked the altar with a sledgehammer oh, Lord uh, to was steal there. the uh, the relics from the altar. Fortunately, uh, they caught him before the containers with the relics were damaged, but mm. he did uh, destroy the altar itself. Mm. So that mm. was in the church where I was ordained a priest. Wow. So I grew up in that place, that very Catholic environment, the monastery, always a part of the life of faith. 
Um, and while it was wonderful to be immersed in that environment, I, I think that part of what happened for me was I took a lot for granted because it just was the air we breathed. Mm -hmm. So it was a part of my life. I never rebelled against it. I never had any issue with being Catholic, but I would say I didn't have ownership of it. It was just part of what I did. And that, and that mm. idea of ownership only developed when I went to college at the University of Arkansas and have to decide to go to mass without it being part of the environment that I'm in so much. And uh, and while I went, I think it took time for, for me to become aware that this is something I want to be a part of my life and not just something I inherited. Mm. So growing up next to a Benedictine monastery and the rich heritage of the liturgical practices of the Benedictines and their charism or at Labora and having that being a part of your youth and, and your development, you know, what was the reason why you didn't kind of move in the direction of the monastery and the Benedictine way of life? And what really tipped you toward uh, diocesan life? So, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. I've wondered <laughs> myself, really, well, you know, well, why not? And I never felt that inclination, uh, even though we were around the monastery a lot. The, the, the nuns that taught in the school, the priests that we had in the parishes, they all came from that Benedictine tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it was because it happened when I went to college, and and that's where that was the first time I ever knew a priest that wasn't Benedictine. The 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 priest that was the the pastor of the campus parish was the example that was in front of me when I was taking ownership, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I started to dig deeper. Uh, I remember having an experience of learning uh, just about. Uh, the miraculous happening in in the world today, uh, stories of people's conversions, miraculous healings. And it struck me that I hadn't really realized it, but I just considered those kinds of miraculous actions to be something of the past, mm -hmm. something of another place. And it hit me that this is happening today. And that awareness yeah. didn't cause a change in behavior, but it caused a significant shift interiorly mm. toward that ownership. And so there was that priest uh, in that experience with campus ministry at the University of Arkansas. So I think that uh, uh, because there was a maturity that happened in that environment, then I gravitated toward that. And then ultimately the reason uh, is because of the, the calling of God. I, I wasn't called to Benedictine life. I was called to the life of a diocesan priest. I think that's a really interesting phrase that you were claiming ownership of your faith. And we so see so many young people that go away to college, and it's the first time where they are now responsible primarily for their own faith. And that's where we see most people in today's world lose their faith. Struggle, yeah. And struggle is in college. And to realize that now it's on you and that you have to claim ownership, you have to wake yourself up and get to mass. I think that's a really, I guess, a great realization, just a way to put it, that there is now time to take ownership. And Preparing kids to take that ownership when they are on their own, mm -hmm. really, really important. You know, they always say, well, we got to teach economics to kids because they're going to have to have to file their taxes. You know, but we teach our kids faith, but do we teach them how to claim that ownership and to perpetuate that faith when they're on their own? That's that's a really great point. There was a sociological treatment. I read this uh, paper a long time ago um, about just fundamentally the psychology of, of a young person in college asking these very principal questions, like the foundational questions of, you know, who am I? Is there a God? Like these things come up to a, a young person's mind. And I'm thinking of the SEEK conference. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I didn't get to go mm -hmm. to the SEEK conference, but to anybody out there that, uh, you know, young people, you know, God bless. It's like your testimony and what you're doing out there is the SEEK conference, the Focus Missionaries. We're just yeah. going to give you guys a big shout out for the work that you're doing. It's really important for the church to be present. Uh, at that mm -hmm. at that level, having pastoral ministry, Our, my buddy Father Mike Schmitz. Yeah, we replaced you with uh, Father Schmitz and with uh, John Hyden from the Catholic Talk <laughs> Show. That? <laughs> Is that not a riot? He made that. Um, but the 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 whole sense of um, you know having a pastoral presence there and the way that you're describing this priest and who he was in your journey is a very special a very special thing because you need a pastoral someone pastoral that can care for you and open your mind to the greatest truths and the, the greatest of all academia is, is the theology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The priest that was there was, you know, that, that a key part of that growth was go into confession with the mm -hmm. kind of different mentality mm -hmm. of really digging deeper, not just saying, well, here's the list of sins and here's the things that I'm supposed to say. So I say them, but more of a searching mm -hmm. kind of confession. So oh, he was the guide in that though. I will say as as my thought process then shifted toward not just ownership of the faith, but toward a priesthood, 
the uh, abbot of the monastery at the time was somebody that my family knew well, and I remember uh, sitting down to talk to him. He tells me he doesn't remember this specific conversation <laughs> uh, at all. How beautiful. Um, but he did <laughs> tell me that, you know, I remember the conversation of these thoughts happening at, at the stage of trying to get out of it. So I remember meeting with him with the hope that he would say, no, that's not really the call. So right. that's not how that works at all. <laughs> Jonah, so that was going to be my relief. Yeah. Uh, but then he went on to say, well, you know, I don't know. But he said, if if this is really from God and you lean into it, it will get stronger. Mm. If it's from God and you run away from it, you'll just remain anxious about it. So the oh. only way to know is Good to counsel. lean in it and let let God be the one to guide you interiorly to that. Excellent advice. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Very good, good advice. So you obviously you leaned into it. What was that experience like? How did you make that decision? And what was your ordination like? And where were you placed after that? You know, what yes. was your life as a parish priest? So it, it happened quickly. He was absolutely mm-hmm. correct. You know, I went through the stages that a lot of seminarians go through, a lot of priests go through, of hearing the call, saying no then wrestling with it, saying maybe, Mm -hmm. and then saying, yes, this is where I'm called. I think that's a standard process, though, uh, with his guidance and the the prayerful support of my family and my grandmother in particular, that all happened quickly. So that by the time I was in the seminary, I was, I felt I was clearly on that path, the trajectory toward a priesthood. And and so the, the years in the seminary were really years to embrace not so much the discernment at that point, but the formation uh, that you are given in order to be the the minister that God wants you to be. So then I was uh, ordained at the monastery. Actually, they uh, because it's a small town, uh, a couple hours away from the cathedral. The bishop agreed to come there so that more of my family and a lot of non-Catholic friends would travel the five miles mm-hmm. to the monastery, but wouldn't have gone two hours to this event. So a lot of people were able to take it in that oh. wouldn't have otherwise. Mm. Uh, and then I was assigned to the biggest parish in the city of Little Rock, and then from there went to a very rural part of the diocese on the Mississippi border, the south, uh, the southeast corner, the Mississippi Delta, the farmlands of Arkansas, and then back through Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is a tourist area, mm-hmm. uh, coming to St. Augustine. Now I get the, the sense <laughs> of what it means to be in a tourist area. And then back to Little Rock for a couple of parishes, including back at the parish where I started when the call came to be made a bishop. But I would say within all of those parish experiences that one significant part of my path was for three years, I was the director of faith formation and permanent deacon formation, which ultimately included a great deal about evangelization uh, as part of the faith formation office. So that those years not in the parish really helped shape the way I understand mm. the parish. Mm. What, um, like out of your, you know, you, you have hindsight now looking back at your priesthood and now, you know, being a bishop, like what are some of the things that, I mean, and I know, I know you also experienced the calling too of a bishop, not just somebody calling you and saying, hey, we're going to make you a bishop, mm. but I don't know, the experience of God just loving you through your priesthood and mm. And now, you know, uh, being elevated to this office, uh, what what are some things in your priesthood that you can kind of look, look back and draw from that you feel like are helping you as, as you're a bi- becoming a bishop? Right. Certainly the part of being a bishop is that you have to step out of the prior experience of being in a parish and everything becomes more broad. Mm-hmm. So now it's a responsibility across a bigger area. Um, and in many ways, you're less directly engaged. So it is the, the bishop represents the unity of the church. And so that unity is expressed within a diocese to connect all the, the activities, the Catholic parts of a, of a church in a particular place, but also to connect the diocese to the larger church mm-hmm. geographically, but then certainly as a successor to the apostles to connect the, the church to the time of Jesus, to the whole history of what it what it means to be universal as a Catholic in in every sense. So one thing that that helped in kind of the understanding of being a bishop was the three years I spent not in a parish because then I was also responsible for some aspect of every parish. So I visited every Catholic church in the state of Arkansas in that role. And and there is that need to be able to look at that bigger picture. Mm. And and one of the challenges certainly that that I have as a bishop uh, are the many things that people want 
Uh, and almost always when I can't give somebody what they want, it's because they're not accounting for mm. the larger picture mm. and who else is affected by this thing mm. that they want to emphasize. Bishop, I'm experiencing that as a pastor, too. If you could, if you could, repeat, if you could repeat exactly what you just said. Like, yeah, so just rewind just like 30 seconds and listen to that. That was excellent. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And, and it's also like, I mean, even in your priesthood, the... Again, like just being a father, like nobody really gave me any uh, book or something mm-hmm. or some manual that I can go. Your kids go home, and figure yeah. it out, right? Yeah. That's it. That's it. You know, it's like okay, so we're leaving now. The the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that feeling. They're like, it's time to go, and we're like, get in the car. We're like, it's kind of nice here. Uh, Is anybody gonna help us out? Do they, <laughs> do they come to the house and tell us what to do? It's nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah. But seeing like you know. You and I are very much alike in, in our passion, and obviously in passion and serving, uh, you know, your parish. You know, uh, you, you could see like you like just being extended a little too far and mm-hmm. old Ricky needed to learn a little well, lesson or that's, two. That's the, be- <laughs> it's the, it's the beauty of formation. Like God brings you to your knees and your weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then the people of God who are just so loving and true and truthful yeah. and beautiful, they'll say, you know, Father, I think. I think it's time for you to go get a, get a little breather, yeah, yeah. you know, or a little break. And and it's it's nice to have that type of exchange. Yeah. And and you realize, like, you know, this is Jesus's church, man. Yeah. It's not it's not my church. I'm going to bed. Exactly. It's it's not my favorite my favorite story is uh, Papa Bono, <laughs> yeah, John the twenty third, and he's yeah. like searching for this one particular letter and he had he had to handle this one piece of business and he's searching through his desk he's he can't find it he can't find it and he's he's done <laughs> and, as, as an italian would and it'd be like you know jesus this is your church <laughs> I'm going to bed. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and then he goes to bed. He wakes up the next day and he goes to his, his office. And the first thing that's right on top of everything is the letter he was looking for. Wow. You know, and I just, I, it keeps me mindful of like, now that's I'm an a Italian, steward. That's an Italian pope. No. A Slovenian pope would have kept up all night and found that letter, right? <laughs> <laughs> what would a Germanic pope uh, <laughs> He would have never misplaced it. Oh! <laughs> There you go. Yes, that was a home run, man. Yes. <laughs> he's got he's got the episcopy, and he's also got the uh, comedic timing. Yeah. He's got the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Now you, you had mentioned your family, um, and you mentioned your grandmother in particular. And I know how much your grandmother yeah. meant to you. How much my grandma's faith inspired me and kept me mm-hmm. Catholic through, you know, my teenage years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, tell us a little bit about your family. Big family. So it was fairly big. My, the bit, the significant thing about my grandmother, so we, we ended up where we did in Arkansas because when I was three, my grandfather died, and we moved in with my grandma. So that was me and my little brother, just two kids. Eventually there would be five. So she was part of my life all along, and she was not only my grandmother, she was my godmother. Mm. Uh, so she was a constant presence in my life, and she was that Catholic who got— stacks of propaganda mail uh, every day and because she would give money and everybody would send her so stacks of mail and <laughs> praying every devotion that, that can be prayed. That's my grandma. That's but my the grandma most too. significant of it was the rosary and the favorite story that people have from my grandmother is so when I was little we would sleep in her bed and then move to the bunk beds in her room when the next kid came along but eventually <laughs> I was a teenager and in my, a, a room with my brother But my bed was only separated from hers by an interior wall, and Mm. she would pray the rosary at night out loud Mm. as she went to bed. So my whole life, including my teenage Uh. years, through the wall, I could hear her praying the rosary out loud. Mm. Uh, Now I know that she was praying those rosaries for me to be a priest, so that really that's the real reason Mm. why I became a priest. I had no chance. It was Mm. because (laughs) of the prayers of my grandmother (laughs) saying, Mm. yes, you'll be a priest. Powerful Uh, prayers. So that was the example. But then... That was the environment of our home as well. So when I was small, my parents were involved in everything in the church and teaching religious ed, involved in Curcio and marriage encounter. So it, again, it was just the air we breathed. So mm-hmm. the fact that we were there all the time, we would be uh, the last ones to leave from mass all the time and, and, and growing up part of whatever was going on. Uh, then eventually then as people matured, the, those responsibilities in the church grew further as well. So my parents went from uh, volunteers in many ways to my dad now being a deacon and and the maintenance man at church. My mom is the secretary of the church and the school, and 
Then I have a brother that works for a Catholic newspaper. I have a sister that is a hospice social worker, a brother that's a, a Catholic school principal, mm -hmm. um, and then a brother that homeschools, and he and his wife are very intentional in, in everything that they do, raising their children, passing on that faith. Mm -hmm. And so I, I frequently tell people I'm the worst Catholic in my family, <laughs> and it's not an exaggeration <laughs> even. For, well, it sounds like the church in Arkansas is held by, together by the pole Myers holding hands. <laughs> right. <you know>? right. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, I mean, you live with your grandmother. I live with my grandmother. Makes a big impact. Mm -hmm. And hearing her mm -hmm. pray through the wall for you is almost like a, mm -hmm. it's almost like understanding the great clouds of saints mm -hmm. in, in right. heaven, how they're praying for you. But to hear it kind of prescient through the wall and, mm -hmm. and understand like in that St. Monica type way, since we were talking, you know, we're in St. Augustine, how she's praying for you, for your conversion, for your, you know, adherence to the faith. I think really cool. I mean... Matri Grandma's get me. I tell you what, me too. <laughs> Matriarchal <laughs> prayer is so powerful. Yeah. When you think about Monica, when you think about our grandmothers, and you know, I, I sleep next to my grandmother's rosary that she died with in her in her hands, and it's her birth, it's my birthstone, and and um, I remember her in the casket with that rosary wrapped around her hands, and um, you know, whenever I'm having a rough night or, or you know. A, patch of struggles and it's like I can't sleep or my mind's like racing, 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 thinking of all these different things. Um, the consolation of our faith, the consolation through the rosary and to realize that, you know, our grandmothers that precede us mm -hmm. in death, precede us in life, precede us in suffering, left us a, a wonderful sacramental mm -hmm. that, uh, that we draw strength yeah. from. I have that rosary of my grandma, and it's stretched out and mismatched beads because mm. it was broken and put back mm. together so many times. Wow. Uh, but it's still a great treasure that, oh, that's that I have. So it's a good beautiful. analogy for the human condition. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. thank God, back to confession. Thank God for thank yeah. God for that. So, what was it like getting the call? How did you find out that you were, you know, becoming a bishop? Well, did you did, know, like, <laughs> were you like on some like short list that you knew about, or? <laughs> There Did is you? a list, but not one you know about. So oh, yeah. this all happens secretly. In fact, it's amazing in today's world mm -hmm. just how secret it is. So there yeah. is no indication. That so Father Rich could be on a so list. There's no, no whispers. There's no whispers of the uh, <laughs> coming from the nunciature. No, no, there's not. They they send out questionnaires that when there is a list, then they do further research by questionnaires of people who know the, the bishops. So bishops turn in names of priests that mm -hmm. could be considered for becoming a bishop, but that's a longer list than sure. will become bishop. Sure. Yeah. And no one knows your name is even on that list. Mm -hmm. So when they decide to do further research, they send out questionnaires. They, they come uh, in these letter envelopes that are marked confidential with very strict instructions. Don't tell anybody. Destroy mm -hmm. this when you're done. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have filled those out for other people over the years, some have become bishops, some not. So that th those are the only people that I would have an inclination, mm -hmm. but that doesn't tell you what's going to happen. Sure. Or not. Can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. what, is, <clears throat> what is the secrecy directed towards? Is it just the anonymity of, or is it more of like the distraction of political like influence? Or I would think probably that. If it, uh, if it became known that it was being considered, then that would have an effect on how you conduct yourself, how other people treat you, and gotcha. would be a distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly seems now that it would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the, to go to that call, uh, he, the nuncio calls, and he called on a Sunday morning. Fortunately, I wasn't able to answer because I was at Mass for the Sunday morning. <laughs> he was checking. <laughs> Is he doing his job? But I can't even imagine if I'd have had that knowledge in my head and then try to celebrate Mass, it would have oh, been yeah. really terrible. So I was finished with Mass when the call came in, and I had just finished Mass. So I'm sitting in my car. I'm looking at movie times on my phone, like I'm going to get some lunch, go see a movie, and then the phone rang. Uh, and it was him, and that's a, he only calls for one reason. So <laughs> when you get that call, there's that moment of shock that's that it. says, oh, is this really happening? And this yeah. disbelief, and it was the only time in my life I literally had to say, okay, start breathing again and remind <laughs> myself to breathe. Wow. And then he's going to say, well, you're going to be a bishop. So then it 
I realized he also said where, and I wasn't paying close enough attention. So he said, oh, wait, where did he say? Oh, St. Augustine. That's right. So it took a minute for that to come together. And then he says, oh, and you can't tell anybody. Uh, So then you hang up the phone. The one person that does know already is your bishop. Mm -hmm. So the bishop of Little Rock, Anthony Taylor, he already knew that this call was coming. And fortunately, he was available that evening. So I could sit down and say out loud the things that were happening and have him have that look on his face of kind of smiling, of remembering the anxiety Uh, of that moment. Um, I mentioned earlier I was in charge of permanent deacon formation, so the timing was really good for me because the two days after I found out, during the time when I couldn't say anything, I had already scheduled a five-day silent retreat for these deacon (laughs) candidates perfect, because they were going to be ordained in just a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So I went into this silent retreat. Fortunately, I couldn't talk to anybody because I couldn't say anything about what was racing through my mind, so no conversation was best. But then they were preparing to be ordained. So the content of their retreat was Uh. preparation for ministry, reflecting on your call. And so it was this perfect thing. The the priest that was giving the talks had no idea that this was in my head. And and so the content was really ideal for me. And then the most beautiful part of that was listening to these men reflect on their formation and their whole life leading up to this call and Mm. and growing in their sense of not having to be worthy and yet Mm. chosen by God nonetheless. And I remember one of the candidates talking about his growth and transformation That was only possible because of the life of the church, Mm. because he was a member of a parish, because the church called him into formation for the diaconate. The church was prepping to ordain him. And so this whole reality of the life of the church was transformative for him. Mm -hmm. My call as a bishop was to facilitate that, to Mm. be that sign of the, the reality of Christ present in his church, a unity that connects us with all of these aspects of Christ among us but focused on the individual person Mm. whose life is going to be changed. Mm. And so it helps me now, while I have to think about the broad reality of all aspects of the church in this diocese, but a reminder that it's always about the individual person who will benefit from whatever ministry is reaching out to them. Bishop, the sense of like the diaconia and the the prophetic nature of that retreat and, and how your whole identity is being affirmed, but you're brought back almost to your diaconate and then forward toward this calling to be the bishop of St. Augustine. Um, Can you speak a little bit more about the diaconia? And I know how important that is for you, the diaconate. And we have six guys that are are all discerning the diaconate here at the parish at JP2. Um, Can you share a little bit more about your diaconate and what that retreat meant in, in service and, and that. Right. And I think it goes back to being ordained a deacon. And, and uh, it's when priests ordain deacons that they actually make the promises that are distinctive about the life, the promise of celibacy and prayer. And uh, the, the promises that really shape the life of priesthood are made as deacons. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so then that's deeply, uh, deeply within us as something we draw from for continued service uh, as a priest. But then after a number of years of being a priest, the bishop tasked me with uh, being the director of a, of a process of permanent deacon formation. So it helped me because now I was given that responsibility. So I spent a lot of time reading documents, various reflections from deacons to try to get my, my head around, well, what is the identity of a deacon uh, and what is formation? And, and so I started to realize more and more or really to articulate that we, we've got the basics. People know a deacon is called to service, and then a deacon has a particular role in the liturgy. They preach, uh, and, and so they have this kind of visible role. Mm-hmm. But as I reflected on it more, the idea is to really in, deepen that identity in them. Mm-hmm. So I got to reflect with them through the process of formation. So what formation means is that we articulate things that otherwise we might take for granted, Um, It also means that we're held accountable for certain aspects of growth and that in being held accountable, we have to do personal evaluations. We have to get input from other people. So a key part of formation is not just that we do the things that the church says, 
but that we are intentionally reflecting on it and getting feedback about it. And it's anybody who's ever taught knows you learn more from teaching mm -hmm. than from studying. Yep, that's so it, it really ingrains it in who you are. And so that, uh, for me, was a chance to share that with them. But, of course, I couldn't share anything with them without looking at myself. Yep. You know, it's kind of like when I visit a seminary today that <coughs> I remember, oh, what it was like to be in a seminary, but I also am inspired and challenged uh, in that environment where you've got these young men really digging and committing themselves to being the priest that they feel God is calling to them to. So it it makes me step back and think about that that beginning sense of identity and how well am I living what I spent so much time preparing for. You're mentioning, too, that leading up to your ordination um, that you actually wore an, an alb uh, underneath everything that was appropriate to a DA. Can you share a little bit of that story? Certainly that, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I had to learn becoming a bishop are all new signs and symbols. Mm -hmm. So I had during that uh, five-day silent retreat, I uh, already had to come up with uh, uh, a motto and a coat of arms and those kinds of things because that would be used in all of the promotion about this. And so reflecting on all the symbols related to it, and because... Becoming a bishop is an ordination. It's considered the fullness of the sacrament of holy orders, mm -hmm. which began at diaconate and then in priesthood and then with being a bishop. And so one of the symbolic ways to be reminded of that was that in addition to wearing the chasuble that a priest wears, I was given as a gift from my spiritual director in the seminary uh, a dalmatic, the, mm -hmm. the clothing of a deacon. Mm -hmm. So I had my alb and the dalmatic and the chasuble uh, that I was wearing to to symbolically carry all that I had been into this new ordination. Did your spiritual director think that you were being ordained the bishop of Anchorage? Because that's a, that's a, that's a lot of clothes to wear. Is that, is that well, hot? Florida, you know, so yeah. it was nice and cool. <laughs> right, <laughs> crank the AC. So, like, you, you, you get this call, and you're in this silent retreat, and, and I want to cover this a little bit later, how you chose your motto and, and your seal, um, but... You hear, okay, St. Augustine, like, had you ever, did you know much about it? Did you start thinking about, okay, I'm moving, and that's, I imagine that's a lot, like, mm -hmm. boom, my life has changed, and I'm moving somewhere else, and I've got all this new responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, like, what was your thought when you heard St. Augustine? Well, the first thought about St. Augustine was I had in my head the knowledge of the historic reality of this diocese, so the... I don't remember when I even learned it, but I knew the date. I knew that in 1565 that Mass was celebrated and the church in this part of the world was really established. So that history really struck me. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned earlier about part of being a bishop is having a broader sense of a diocese, but I think it's also the broader sense of the church. Mm -hmm. And so to come into the <clears throat> richness of history in this place was an extraordinary privilege um, and then, of course, Florida is also in the minds of people all over as a destination. Sure. So the excitement of coming here, uh, to be part of that history that now I've been privileged to learn even more about. And so there is that excitement of moving forward. But then there's the sadness of leaving what I have mm -hmm. known. And I was struck many times by, you know, driving down mm -hmm. a street or going to a certain store as okay, I'm not going to be coming back here again. And and so there is that that grieving mm -hmm. of letting go. Um, but then all of that in my mind is is shaped by back to the diaconate. It's in the diaconate that the promise of obedience happens. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was never a question of yes or no. I felt like I said yes uh -huh. in 1997 yep. uh, when I promised obedience to the church. Is there any food you miss from back there? Food in Arkansas, mom's food. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what it is. <laughs> and then, uh, my favorite meal of all time is mom's <clears throat> Thanksgiving dinner. So uh -huh. that's uh, that's the what I miss. Your mom is such a beacon of light and your family just, you know, around your mom and your dad, just, just the family dynamic I was just so impressed by. Um, seeing that in, through a priestly lens, seeing that at now as a bishop, um, being pulled in so many different directions, I can't even imagine what your inbox looks like <laughs> or, or, the, or your to-do list or your, your schedule. Um, how do you prioritize family? How do you fulfill the commandment, like honor your mother and your father, being pulled in, a, in, a, in so many directions? And what does that mean to you? Certainly modern technology is at the heart of that. I mean, the, the family text is mm -hmm. is kind of a constant reminder. And so we always know what's going on. Somebody brings up something that they're praying for. And because of the 
the the family dynamic being built on on that prayer that that's kind of a constant thing is here's the prayer intentions of the moment but then it also keeps us plugged into the things that are fun so being here uh, in Florida the last week I was getting texts from my family in Arkansas who was missing <laughs> school because of ice and snow <laughs> so I got to see uh, hear that story and of course now I have to to share that I had this screenshot of my five year old niece and her virtual school when she was iced in decided she should appear as Chewbacca for her, uh, for her virtual school. So I have a screenshot of the, awesome. the kindergarten classroom and there's little Chewbacca in the middle of it. That's cute. That's cute. Uh, Great kids. So I, I remember Father Rich told us that well, I've got a new bishop coming and we were supposed to do a hiking trip in Colorado mm-hmm. and he's like, guys, I'm not going to be able to go on this. I want to be here and present for it. And so we kind of, um, I guess, tangentially got to experience it, not like you did. But he was letting us know, okay, well, the bishops, you know, the mass is this day. Uh, he's, you know, here's the crest. Can you, you know. Um, so I know that we kind of experienced it a little bit. But what was that experience like for you and moving in? And, and I know there's a whole the ritual behind it and knocking on the door and all this really beautiful tradition. The signs like and symbols are Yeah, I'd like to hear about that. I would say the first experience of it all is the just powerful excitement of everybody. So it really started with the announcement so it's secret until it becomes announced at noon in Rome, which was 6 a.m., 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. here. So I was here secretly mm-hmm. uh, to be prepped for a press conference. And, and back in the day, before the the, f- the speed of communication, there would be an, an, a press conference, and you didn't know who was going to show up mm-hmm. as the new bishop. Now everybody can find out immediately. So by the mm-hmm. time the press conference happens, everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Bishop Estevez, who was uh, the bishop here before me, he had prepared a two-day whirlwind tour. So I went to see as many churches and communities as I could in this time. Before the announcement? Well, during the announcement and after. After, okay. Okay, so before the announcement, a couple because it was known already. Mm -hmm. Um, But what struck me, and that's part of the kind of growing into the role, was the sheer excitement of that. And I was really struck by the, the difference so I was here, and there was great excitement. Nobody knew me. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't a personal excitement. It was, there's a bishop. And there mm-hmm. was that sense that you represent something, this church continuing in that unity again of we are part of something bigger. And mm-hmm. it was so palpable, and it, it struck me. In fact, I remember being in a, a convenience store in that little bit of time, and the, the girl at the register that g- gave me change, I said, thank you. And she said, you're welcome, Bishop. So like, I couldn't believe this yeah. person had seen the press conference, yeah. recognized oh, me. Cool. And so mm-hmm. that was kind of that, uh, that moment of surprise. Um, and then I went home, and back in Arkansas, it was a very different excitement because it was, a, it was the personal. Mm-hmm. It was the we're, we're, ha- we're proud of you, we're happy for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was personal. So it's both mm-hmm. that you're called as the human being that you are, but you also have to grow into the identity of representing something that means a lot to people. So the symbols then, they capture that. Mm-hmm. Um, so people associate the bishop with the staff and the mitre. And and so when I'm this morning, I had mass in one of our schools. And so I make sure when I'm preaching to wear that. So it creates a visual for little kids to know there's this person. Yeah. Uh, and there's this excitement when he shows up and he's different because he has these things. Uh, and so it, 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 it creates all kinds of questions and, and kind of a beautiful connections. First time my son saw our bishop, he's like, is that Santa? He's like, what's going on? He's like, he saw it. He's like, what the, who is this? You know, it it is. I mean, the visual impact of the bishop showing up to a kid is important because Mm -hmm. you could just tell by those symbols, by the Mm mitre, by the crozier, that it is, wow, this this is something, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a very cool experience. All of our kids got the commemorative Uh coin uh, that that we designed. And in fact, uh, I think it was, I'm forgetting who the team member was. It was um, JC. JC. Yeah. So JC worked on uh, the, the coin that we had, and, um, and it has the coat of arms. And I remember um, I, was, I felt bad, but I was kind of like, Bishop, do, do we get the coat of arms? Do we get the coat? And it's like, you've had so much going on. It's like, I don't want to be like a pest. But you got the coat of arms in. It shared like a little bit of uh, the history behind it. Yeah, kind now, of let's put that up on the yeah, screen for now. Those, for those of you who don't know about um, what the coat of arms is, but every bishop gets one. So, Bishop, could you explain what the coat of arms is, just generally speaking, and then how you approach the design 
of your coat of arms. You said you know, every bishop gets one, but mm -hmm. that was the big shocker to me is that nobody gives it to you. You have to <laughs> yeah. create one. Um, so that was part of the expectation without much explanation mm -hmm. of what that means. So every diocese has a coat of arms and then a bishop has a personal coat of arms. So when you see uh, a, a bishop who's the ordinary of a diocese, then his coat of arms will be connected with the diocese. If he's an auxiliary bishop, for example, he'll only have the personal coat of arms. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So that's all part of the mm -hmm. symbolism of representing this tradition of the church. And of course, the coat of arms, it, it, it's the same tradition as any kind of heraldry. So a lot of families have coat of mm -hmm. arms. So what you're doing is you're trying to create a symbolic representation of both your heritage as, where, uh, as well as what, what you value in the ministry that you're beginning. Mm -hmm. So for some people, if they have a definitive coat of arms in a family, it's kind of obvious what you would choose. Sure. But there, I had no history of that. So it was really wide open as to how to design it. And I talked to various people to get input. And then uh, one of the things that you are given is contact information to people with expertise in designing and and creating it once you decide what symbols that you want to have. Cool. So mm -hmm. I had somebody that I could say, here's what I want, and they could give me drafts and, and uh, discuss it, but then various conversations about what is good. And one of the, the best kind of tips I got was that there, the temptation is to put everything that matters to you in it. And I was told to remember that this is going to be shrunk down to letterhead. Yep. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and so it needs to be simple enough that it can be recognized. So the various symbols in my own, so uh, coming from Arkansas, the patron of the Diocese of Little Rock is St. Andrew. Mm -hmm. St. Andrew famously represented in the cross in the shape of an X. So the central X uh, is the representation of my whole spiritual heritage, which was in the Diocese of Little Rock, represented with St. Andrew. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Andrew was also my confirmation name. So it, it taps into that, that personal history of the grace of God at work as well. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, my own the calling into the priesthood and much of my personal devotion was through the Blessed Mother. I mentioned mm -hmm. the rosary. That was part of not only my grandmother's life, but my whole family. So I wanted some representation of that. And then in the, the symbolic tradition, there's a lot of images that capture who Mary is. And so then the crescent moon that's there uh, is a symbol of Mary. Um, you know, so we have that. That's right. In various images, Our Lady of Guadalupe, I went to the North American College in Rome. Uh, that's on the image of mm -hmm. the Immaculate Conception. That's the patroness of our country. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it's, you know, the, the moon under her feet. Mm -hmm. So I wanted a symbol to represent Mary. And I looked at various ones and the one, the crescent just resonated with me. And then talking to the to someone about the tradition of heraldry, they said, well, it can have it once or it can be repeated so I, I liked the look better with the repeating crescent, but it also seemed to capture the notion of evangelization, that we are called to the four corners of the world. So the four quadrants in my mind also represents the evangelization to the whole world. And of course, the best evangelizer ever yep. is Mary um, with Our Lady of Guadalupe here. <laughs> she she brings them in by the millions yes, while the rest does. of us kind of struggle along. Pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Truly. I got my brother-in-law. <laughs> I mean, it's not 11 million people in eight years, but something. Uh, it's something. So I'm doing my part. Oh, and gosh. then, and then, Bishop, you have uh, seek first the kingdom of God, and I remember hearing that in your opening, very clearly, your opening uh, speech to the whole diocese and that news release and everything. What was the inspiration behind that scriptural verse? I'd say it was a couple of things, and and during that retreat, that silent mm -hmm. retreat, I I was able to focus on that, and I'm again grateful for that because. If I'd had a normal schedule, I wouldn't have had blocks of time or the prayerful atmosphere mm -hmm. to reflect on it. So that came about as part of that, that silent retreat. So I would say two things. One was people ask all the time, what's your favorite Bible verse? And some people kind of go with, well, it depends on the moment and what's going on in my life. And the way my brain works uh, is trying to get down to what seems most fundamental, mm. to what is it that everything else is built on? Uh, and so I like this passage always because of that, seek first the kingdom of God as a very fundamental passage, one of the kind of passage other things can stand on to carry out mm -hmm. the, the work of the, of, of the mission. 
So that was part of it, that this resonated with me always as a favorite scripture passages because of that foundational nature of it. And then as a reminder to keep first things first, we can easily Mm -hmm. go down long paths, giving energy and attention to the wrong thing and wonder why it's not working. Um, And so as a reminder to me. But then the other aspect of this, as I reflected on not just my favorite Bible verse, but the ministry of being a bishop, Mm -hmm is that the notion of the kingdom of God is is rich and diverse. And so we have uh, Jesus preaching about this frequently, and there's a lot of different directions you can go. So it captures a lots of things because there isn't a clear definition of what that means. Yep. So instead, there's a lot of reflection on mm. the kingdom of God is like, as Jesus himself mm-hmm. says. So it, it kind of opens the door to the broad good of a diocese so that I wanted to capture... So you're committed to this aspect of ministry. You're committed to this aspect of ministry. And too often, we end up arguing with each other over which is correct. And the idea of the kingdom of God means we need both. And if we're neglecting either, then we're not fulfilling the command mm-hmm. to seek first the kingdom of God. It's excellent. Yeah, it's really cool. And there's other elements to the coat of arms uh, that, that I think would be very illuminating. Uh, there's like a hat with tassels. Or it looks like a, a, a processional cross of some sort that has like a pointed end, like a sword almost. Um, you know, any, any reflections there? Well, some of those are the standards of, that, that indicate that it belongs to a bishop. Uh, so they're in the traditions. They're, they're things that tell you what kind of coat of arms it is, a personal one or yeah. an institution or whatever. Yeah. So the, the, the hat with the tassels um, represents it being a bishop. And then the, actually the, the uh, tiered tassels represent the fullness of holy orders. So the one tassel for the diaconate, mm-hmm. the two for the priesthood, and then the three for being a bishop. And then the processional cross is another indicator of being bishop. Those are pretty standard. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, though, as I mentioned, the, the personal coat of arms, which is the, the crescents and the X, uh, the St. Andrew cross represent my personal one. And then on the other side is the, the coat of arms for the diocese of St. Augustine. And it's a great privilege, uh, to be in a diocese that's already named for a saint yeah. so that we have a patron that's very clear for us. Mm-hmm. And then the pierced heart there to represent the restless heart of St. Augustine. Mm-hmm. It's really awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've went through the ordination and you've, and you've made all these considerations. Then the reality of being a bishop hits. You know, there's the excitement, the personal and the general excitement. But then then you got to open up your desk and you got to start getting to work. So what's that experience like where you start to say, okay, now the reality of the situation hits in and now I've got to start going to parishes, doing assessments. How do you, how do you approach <clears> that? Because... Like, is there a book like how to be a bishop for? You well, know, the other thing too bishops? is like, is like, what were your expectations? Of course, you're going to have expectations yeah. of like what this is supposed to be like, and then you start doing it. It's kind of like parenting, right? Sure. You know, you're like, uh, okay, let's just start doing it, and we'll figure this out. You know? <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. I think that applies uh, certainly because there isn't. Uh, there isn't a lot of specific guidance mm-hmm. about, okay, this is what you do. There is a great fraternity, I will say that, that uh, you know sometimes people have a negative impression about the bishops as a group in the United States, yeah. but uh, it was an overwhelming welcome um, okay. and a com- beautiful sense of we're glad you're here to be a part of this. Encouragement, the uh, offers of if you need to talk about something, then give me a call. And, and so that fraternity is a, is a key part of that because mm-hmm. that, there is that, that notion of having peers that mm-hmm. we need. And yep. it's be only our peers grasp exactly. So my experience and, and uh, part of my preparation that helped me to become a bishop was being involved in the Diocese of Little Rock in the, the various boards that the bishop has. So he has advisory groups. Right. And so I was on those for probably more years than not as a priest. And I, I distinctly remember lots of conversations about pretty complex situations, not exactly clear where to go and being able to give my input and say, well, good luck, bishop. And uh, <laughs> I would go. I don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> Wipe your hands clean. So now I watch those priests go out the door and say, good luck, bishop, as we finish our oh, meetings. Man, and, uh, so, so, so that's one of the, the biggest yeah. changes wow. um, is being aware of that. But again, it doesn't depend on me that it's part of seeing uh, that there are so many people doing so many good things. Mm-hmm. And and so a huge part of being the bishop is to be an encourager. Um, and so people 
they they want they want to know that the good work they're doing matters. Mm-hmm. You know, what I find as I visit places is people are not looking for a pat on the back so much. People appreciate that, and it's important that I would say that. But what they most want is a sense that what I'm doing matters and what I'm doing is connected to this bigger truth. And so getting used to the excitement of showing up somewhere, that's new to me because sure. I walk in and it's just me. Like, okay, what's the big deal? <laughs> Don't cross experience that. Everywhere he goes, everywhere he goes. They're like, all right, now the party starts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that, but then they're so excited to show you what they've yeah. done. And, and so that it's that sign of unity again. It's that they realize here we are and we can feel like we're in this forgotten part of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you're here says, no, it's not forgotten. It's part of this wow. bigger reality. Oh, and that, that's, yeah, that that's, matters a lot to people. And it's, it's part of being an encourager. And that's the great joy. Um, and, and God provides grace to say that becoming a bishop is an ordination. Mm-hmm. Doesn't just mean that you know, you're changed so that you have the office. It's that you receive grace to fulfill the office. Mm. And that part of that fulfillment that I experience is an kind of an additional boost of just energy mm-hmm. um, because uh, I have to be engaged with people and share in the excitement that they experience. And, and if I don't do that, then it's going to have a negative effect on mm. their their whole experience. And so that doesn't come about as the result of my own personality or ability. I sense that very strongly as the grace God provides so that what people need from this ministry uh, is given to them. And that's a, I think that's just as a great thing to think about, too, that, that God, our God, is an encourager, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, a lot of people get scrupulous with, you know, their sinfulness or whatever, and God's constantly giving us his mercy, his love, encouraging us, building mm-hmm. us up. I think that's a kind of a neat reflection for him being in persona, mm-hmm. you know, for the, the diocese, mm-hmm. you know. And the, the experience, too, just like the, the insightfulness of, of that point where the bishop is a sign of unity, a bishop is, is a sign of um, encouragement, and you, you institution, you church, you ministry, you whatever it is, it's like you're a part of the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God, and and to get that sense, even listening to you, applying it to my priesthood and and pastorally caring for the individual person and the dignity of that person, and responding and communicating, because so many people feel lost or they feel like they're they're not a part of anything, they're mm-hmm. not a part, you know. And you may be out there right now feeling that way too as, as a listener or a viewer um, to realize that even this show, God willing, is communicating that very truth to you um, because we are all chosen by God. We all have a very dignified identity rooted in our baptism as children of light, as children of God. And I just, I, my eyes just opened up just looking at my priesthood in that, in that manner too I mean, that I get to share in in, your, in the fullness of your priesthood. Um, I mean, even special. when you show up as a priest, I mean, it's not the same as the fullness of a bishop, but it's mm-hmm. a big deal. Like mm-hmm. when is. you come around and my son Johnny sees you, he's like, it's a priest. It's a buddy. big deal, Hi, you Johnny. know? I'm and, you know, buddy. you're a family friend, but still that, yeah. that visible it's sign. Just, uh, it, it, like what's getting to <clears throat> me here is just the, the link to the sacramental side of, like he was saying, like I'm still a person, but what I experience and what God's giving me is, is almost like it's supernatural, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just like literally yeah. like what... It's what mm. Christ wants for His people, right? And 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 and, mm. and this this vehicle of the sacrament is His way of doing that, yeah. right? It's just like an amazing. Mm. Well, ultimately, amazing there's thing. one thing we share in, which is God. We are called yeah. into that life of God. Yeah. I mean, to take the fact that the Scripture tells us, "Call no man father." We could be left with, "Well, why do we call priest father? Why do we call you father?" Mm-hmm. Well, because we're called to share mm-hmm. in the life of God. So to be a biological father is a recognition that God is the creator. And so I share in the work of the Mm. father to become a father. The priest is called a priest because it's God's work, and we're called to share in that work. So there's only the one work, Mm -hmm. uh, the work of God, the mission. (laughs) And so whatever aspect of it we are contributing to, that's the idea of a connection. Again, Mm -hmm. there's the one work, and we all have a role to play in it. Mm -hmm. 
I think so many times people can forget that, that it's like my work, mm -hmm. my struggle, my thing. And yeah. The, the, the unity, and well, yes. that means bishop. It's not <laughs> unity, so. But that it's the work. Bishop's being effective it's, at his job. Yeah, 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 he's doing bishoping. Wait, is this a pastoral visit? This is or is this a interview? Interview? <laughs> it's never not a pastoral visit. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah, I'm no, that's that really. Pulling that, out the hanky. Yeah, no, that one hits me is that it's the work. That's a great reflection that yeah. I've never heard before. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. It's the work. So, first day as a bishop, there's no miraculous John the 23rd. You found the document. It's found the richest file right on top of the desk. You know yeah, what? they stack up for me the things I should look at yeah. first. So, I'll let you guess where Father Richard's file is in the list. Oh, 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 I'm not committing to anything, but you can tell. Uh, you can it's guess. It's like you opened it a lot. It's well used. It's worn out of it. It's just a whole box now. It's like a banker's box. <laughs> banker's box. Uh, but what's volume it like, one. What's volume it like one. meeting the priests of your, you know, so you're going around, you're visiting the parishes. Uh, how do the priests respond to you and what's that like? So when I first came here, um, I actually met all of the priests before I was ordained. So I moved here to get settled in before I went on a, actually there's another retreat I went on because uh, you have a personal retreat in addition. So I wanted to meet the priests. And so we scheduled a mass at one of the local parishes and all of the priests came and it was July. Some of them were on vacation and uh, it was part of just how powerful this is for me to see them come in. And certainly as a priest, you know, the impact of having the bishop and both in uh, terms of who he is, but also the effect he can have on your life because mm -hmm. he determines all kinds of things. So I knew it was of great significance and feeling a little weight of, okay, well, that's a big responsibility. Um, and so then to show up that day and all of the priests that were there, and, and it was my first impression was that same kind of excitement of, okay, this, this represents the kind of continuing of the call that we have to carry out our ministry, that uh, the bishop represents that moving forward in the life of the church. But uh, also in the reflections I had done were uh, reading uh, Pope John Paul II and different people on, on the bishop talking about the collaborative nature of it. So I had already been kind of formulating the understanding that these priests are the key to carrying out this mission, that the priests are the ones that I will rely on so that they're, they're crucial to me in being able to be the bishop that I hope to be, um, as well as that notion we talked about earlier of being an encourager, of, of helping see that, that the ministry that, that you have really matters. And mm -hmm. I was also struck by... In the, the variety of who's represented. So you've got priests just ordained, you've got priests 50 years ordained, mm -hmm. you have priests that have served from other countries, and so it's a really a big cross-section of the life of the church. And and so to, to be able to respond to somebody just ordained who's now imagining years with me as, as a bishop, but then somebody who's already retired and, and mm -hmm. seeing the excitement that they have and, and wanting that, that same encouragement. In fact, since I've been here, a couple of, of the retired priests have died, and I remember going to see the oldest priest that we had who really never knew me. He met me once and already in a diminished capacity, and, and uh, there were people gathered around his bed, and when it clicked that Oh, the bishop was here. His eyes got really big, and there was this excitement of a blessing mm -hmm. because of being the bishop. And so, again, it just highlights it's not the personal part, mm -hmm. and yet the personal part also matters. Sure. And so being able to sit down and, and joke around with, uh, with the priests and, and uh, learn to be excited about things like Jaguars football and, <laughs> and uh, talk to the things that matter. So there, there's this great desire for the connection, the human connection about the things that are just enjoyable about life, and then the spiritual connection of, again, the one work that is carrying out the mission that comes from Jesus. So the relationship of the priest and the bishop is crucial, and I'm grateful uh, for the welcome I've received from the priests and, and already witnessing the ministry of the priests and going to the parishes and watching how the people respond to their priests. And so mm -hmm. the favorite thing of most bishops is when people come up and say, don't move our priest, yeah. <laughs> um, because that shows that they have this connection, this excitement about mm -hmm. his ministry. Oh, I thought you were going to say, because it's less work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I love it when people say that. <laughs> And then, you know, you have the beautiful Basilica th Cathedral downtown, and, and the rector there is, we love Father Tom oh, yeah. so much. He's 
He's our, uh, he's our buddy. He's our spirit animal, I think. He's our yeah. spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> great way to describe him. Like, you know, because I know how much of an impact he's had to both of you guys. Yeah. Uh, but the cathedral there is beautiful oh. and historic and that, that area. But then you're also, your offices are downtown too. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. The Mandarin. Ma- Mandarin. 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 Yeah, it's, it's not near. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. about 45 minutes from the yeah. cathedral to the offices, but... It's the cathedral because of the historic reality of it, but the yep. population base shifted, and so yep. I'm closer to more parishes and and more of the people that work uh, at the at the diocese mm-hmm. can live closer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know a lot of par- a lot of dioceses will have things like co cathedrals for specifically reasons like that. Where, yeah, Galveston, you know, Houston's one now. Yeah. yeah, or I know where Bishop Barron is now up in Minnesota. It's now Rochester, Winona, where Winona was the h- historical population center, yep. but it's moved towards Rochester. So that's that's an interesting. I love thing. how they keep. Tradition and the naming, like mm-hmm. uh, the you know nomenclature of the diocese, is like Galveston, Houston. Well, right. Galveston was where it was founded. So mm-hmm. and then it, the population moved, but yet Galveston still because mm-hmm. of the hurricane. Yeah, they, they all that you know. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the last things that I was really interested in finding out is what are some of the things that you hope to accomplish as a bishop? What are you, where's your pastoral heart lie? You know, I've watched some videos of you online, and I know that you have a, a love. Eucharistic love. Uh, I watched a, I think it was a retreat that you gave on that. Um, but like, what are some of the things that you want to focus your Episcopal ministry on in the Diocese of St. Augustine and in the church in, in large? You know, what's your share of the work? I think that uh, to go back to the Episcopal motto that I chose and uh, choosing that because of having to have a foundation and, and needing to keep first things first, I would say it's evangelization because ultimately, Nothing that we do in the church makes any sense or has any meaning apart from Jesus Christ. And I think that one of the biggest problems in the church very often is that we're, we presume that we're standing on that foundation, whereas our culture has moved so far away mm-hmm. from that foundation mm-hmm. that so many things that we take for granted are not understood at all. And if we just think logically mm-hmm. that many of the debates we have in the life of the church, many of the controversial issues... Uh, we, are, we find ourselves at odds because we start by believing that what God desires matters, but we are in a culture that doesn't believe that what God desires matters. So until we build that foundation that who Jesus is and what he teaches matters, well, then nothing we say is going to make sense. It wouldn't make sense if that isn't true. Mm-hmm. So that has to be the foundational premise. So then it it becomes a matter of evangelization, which is a return to the basics, is, is a clarification of what does it mean to be a disciple. So then how do we how do we help cultivate discipleship so that the people that are sharing in the work uh, are are really drawing their strength from and pointing to Jesus Christ? Mm. Mm. Excellent. And the the evangelization, um, the new evangelization or, or the evangelical act of the church where the, the church is always called to proclaim the kingdom of God and, and how that has been the identity of the church from the beginning. I always express to the community here um, that if a church is not rooted in outreach and evangelization, it's a church that's dying. And, and we have to constantly be going out of ourselves to meet human suffering, you know, spurred on by the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God, and reaching out and in, in reaching out to the poverty that is present in your local community develops those relationships at the very core level of, of Christ's love alive in a, in a church. Yeah. You know, a church is only as healthy as its outreach programs and, and its, and its uh, evangelization programs. Um, your experience, I've, I've watched a number of your videos too online at like 6 to 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning <laughs> in my bed when you were announced. Um, you're a great teacher. I mean, obviously, uh, we've been very impressed just listening and, and learning. Um, you know, you, you shifted very quickly online uh, during COVID. Um, you know, the, the prayerfulness that I am just so deeply impacted by um, in solidarity with you. I just, I feel the, the depth of your prayer life um, and, and just seeing the decisiveness of, of your office and just the clarity that you provide and the unity that you provide, just uh, stepping in is just a great gift. 
uh, to the diocese, to, to, to us, to me, uh, as, as, as one of your priests. Um, and, and thanks for showing us what it's like to kiss up to a bishop. To, <laughs> well, I mean, I, <laughs> when Bishop Estevez was here, I did it. Well, you know, like I, we didn't really do it with, uh, you know, Bishop Toops too no, much. No, you, guys, no. you guys are a little familiar with Bishop Toops. I don't know Bishop Toops, so I'm going to be on good yeah. behavior. And you guys are like, you know, Archbishop Cordelion, there may have been a little bit of that too. Yeah, yeah I think, I think a little bit of that. That, that was a little. I can always tell because your voice gets that was, really. Well, that was just <laughs> a tough. That was just a tough time, man. Yeah, I mean, that was. was a tough time during COVID for Archbishop. That was a yeah. challenging situation. But you know, <coughs> that being said, Bishop, um, you know, from your heart, what does evangelization look like uh, on the local level for the parish, and then for um, your position as a bishop? Like, so I think that. It's keeping the first things first. And so it's, it's you know, preaching that foundational truth. And, and it has to be repeated many times mm-hmm. to sink in. Mm-hmm. And so I think that we need evangelization in the sense that it has to be outreach, but it has to be outreach about who Jesus is because mm-hmm. we can be misguided by doing good works. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, I was just reading a reflection from Pope Benedict uh, talking about the, the Jesus and his interactions with people people about the law in the Gospels. They're debating over (coughs) what is the purpose of the law and that that he then talks about, well, it's not just these pure practices of purity, the ritual purity, but it's about the practice of charity. Mm. And that in his commentary, he said that, well, we can replace one action, ritual purity, with another action, which is works of charity, and still miss the point Mm. that what we are called to is the encounter with Jesus Christ. That what he's ultimately teaching is that things are different, not because I'm giving you works of charity instead of works of ritual purity. Things are different because I'm here, Mm. because Mm. Christ is the Messiah come into the world that liberates, that redeems. So that has to be the focus. (laughs) And so we could easily replace one work with another work and Mm -hmm. still be doing the works Mm. instead of recognizing that it's, it's the knowledge of Jesus and the sharing of how our lives are transformed, that has to be evangelization. Yeah, one of the things that struck me is with that is, you know, seek first the kingdom of God. If you're in a ministry, that there's a lot of things that can draw you away from the relationship mm-hmm. that you have with mm-hmm. Christ, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're busy. And there's a good reason for it. And so sometimes that good becomes the driver of, you, of, of, of how you approach it instead of the goodness of, of God and, and experiencing the healing love, the, the constant encouragement that we're talking about. And that relationship is, is what drives us to carry him into the world, yeah. right? If, it, if it's not driving us to carry him into the world, then sometimes we just get a little distracted. Mm-hmm. And like I've seen, like you were mentioning, I've seen a lot of ministries where uh, we, we work with a lot of Catholic organizations and some are, are really focused on the work that they're doing and and some some are not you know um you know drawing their strength from the altar yeah. you know so to speak even you know? with like some of the calls we've been on with religious communities sometimes yeah no you know, i like, mean that, that's it's either about survival or it's yeah. about growth yeah. but then but knowing that like i've heard it said and it, it might have even been from the same reflection but it's like christ didn't even have to say anything mm-hmm. it was by the virtue of his incarnation and his nature mm-hmm. that salvation is is given to us so those things are you know incredibly important but they can they can be disoriented right mm-hmm. the orientation is seek first the kingdom of god and those are all the things that are necessary in the kingdom of god but if, what are you doing them for <laughs> if it's not right. you know focused on you know the ultimate goal mm-hmm. right and i think about it like you know i'm very eucharistic too as well I had a eucharistic conversion but it's like we're monstrances right in the world right so we receive Christ, we open our hearts, we seek his mercy, and then we carry him into the world, hopefully with a lot of purity and excitement about what you're doing. But that journey that you're on with him is ever changing. It's, yeah. it's, it's landscape is always it, it's changing. always it's open. An it's and I'm an entrepreneur, so I love it, right? Yeah. Like I, lo- I, I yeah, love that about God. It's so exciting. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I think the Eucharistic reality we have to be conscious of that again, we we have to go back to even more basic. Okay, so I think one of the problems is we, because our world has moved away from spiritual understanding, even the word Eucharist 
doesn't resonate with people. We hear all the bad statistics of people who no longer believe. Mm -hmm. And it's again, a it's a faulty presumption that when many Catholics who whose life has been built on understanding the Eucharist, when they talk Eucharist, they mean that brings me into contact mm -hmm. with Jesus. But they don't say that. Mm -hmm. They say you should go to church because of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And they mean Jesus. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for somebody who doesn't see the connection mm -hmm. between Jesus, Eucharist, they hear Eucharist and they don't hear Jesus. And mm -hmm. they might think, oh, I went to an Episcopalian church last week and I yes. received the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. and then you're, so you're, you're mm -hmm. not able to like, right. yeah. I had a conversation with somebody about that. I mm -hmm. was like, no, no. How do I explain this? It's Jesus, really. Yeah, I know. That's, that's Jesus. But that's I went what to the Eucharist. Says. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah. And yeah. what a gift that it was that you grew up in a in an area where it was like 4% Catholicism and, and growing up in a context where I'm sure you had many opportunities to just kind of share, you know, the, the faith of, of the church uh, in relationship. And we have so many friends online and so many people that are listening in and, and viewing our content that are not Catholic. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's a, it's a privilege to have this conversation and this forum where we can, we can share some of these details of, uh, what we believe, how we believe, how we practice and, uh, and where it's centered. Yeah. Maybe we start a whole campaign at just like shirts or something that says, I eat Jesus. <laughs> and then people are like, Whoa, dude, what's up with that? <laughs> You're, you're a marketing like, you're genius. You're, you're, you are a marketing genius, man. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you're, you blow my mind. This guy sometimes. eats Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I do. It's great. Now, you're speaking about shy. marketing, there's two things of housekeeping and one thing that is an exciting new addition. So the first is, yes. I want to give a shout out to our, one of our sponsors, Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is an incredible program for men who want to reorient themselves towards Christ using practices of the church like asceticism, fraternity, and prayer. So if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Exodus, you can learn about this program that over 45,000 men have taken part of this year alone to help them become the man that God intended and created them to be. And let's focus. Let's let's face it, too. We all need to be reset mm -hmm. sometimes. And the ascetical life gives you that chance of resetting, reorienting your life and and you know, building up that fraternity is yeah. the greatest aspect of what Exodus does. And I know this hot-blooded Italian over here, he loves the cold showers as well. Yeah, that's why I do it. <laughs> <laughs> then our other sponsor is Hollow. Hollow is the number one Catholic prayer app in the world. They've had over a billion prayers prayed through this app. There is so many resources, whether it's uh, sacred music, whether it's night stories to help you sleep, whether it's meditations, whether it's uh, the daily examines, whether it's... Um, you know, having Bible stories read to you by uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Rumi, Rumi or yep. Bishop Barron or Mark Wahlberg or Sister Miriam or Father Mike Schmitz. You can go on there and do the uh, Catechism of the Year or the Bible in the Year. It's a great app. Go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash exodus. catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow. You can download the app and try it free. So those are our sponsors. I want to give them a shout out because they're so good to help us, you mm -hmm. know, be able to afford to have lights and have a clean environment. Um, Clean so environment. For when the Ball bishop heads. comes over so that, you know, we can <laughs> represent well. But we have, um, everyone knows about our show, knows about the bobbleheads. But I think this is an exciting opportunity to show that we have a new edition. Uh, yeah, so and if you're listening, if you're now, listening in on iTunes or Spotify or any of those other Audible Podbean. services like Podbean, my favorite, <laughs> um, you know, you're going to want to turn on Podbean. the YouTube for this. And <laughs> if you're on YouTube right now and you haven't clicked the subscribe button and you haven't pushed the thumbs up, what's what are you waiting for? Please, we'll, just we'll do wait, that. Wait, it takes less yeah. than three seconds. Do so that while I prepare this. And they're all subscribed now. Drum so roll, easy. please. Howard. <laughs> <laughs> the new bobblehead. The new bobblehead for the table. Who does that look like? Oh, you tell me in the comments section. <laughs> Wait a second. Is that your bishop? This is my bishop. <laughs> I want to give a big shout out to the Evil family, uh, friends of the family of the Pole Myers, um, who sent me this in the mail. And we are so happy. That Bishop, you're here in the diocese, and now you're going to be here on the table next to Wait, the great German. German oh, 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 very well. Where do you want to go? We'll let oh, you yeah. pick. <laughs> well, if we've got the option of of uh, the the German Shepherd, then I should go with him. Okay, uh, there you <laughs> go, one German man. Shepherd to another. That's awesome. I love it. Rest, Rest in, in peace. And then let's move and the, uh, the Gordon Fisherman. Do you want the Do you want the Gordon's fisherman to move something else? <laughs> That's put him on top of the swear jar. Yeah. Yeah. The first dollar that went in there was actually from Howard. That's right. 
Um, but yeah, so the, that's you know that's how the collection grows. Yes, and how we're going to build this sanctuary out in, in Nocatee. Yeah, so. <laughs> one, one swear <laughs> time. <laughs> Thank you, sailors for over here, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we have some sailors here. Um, but yeah, this, this was really cool, and, and I think for our listeners, getting to have the com- opportunity to have a conversation with the bishop because so when you special. see your bishop again, you know he rolls in, he's got the miter, the crozier, and it's like wow, it's the bishop, and then. He's on to another pair. Mm-hmm. So how often do you get the opportunity to really get a you know in-depth conversation? So uh, for everyone around the world, we have listeners all over. It's an opportunity to talk to a bishop. For the people listening here in the Diocese of St. Augustine, you're getting the opportunity to know more about your bishop. But this is an honor for us. And we, number one, appreciate you coming on. And number two, allowing us us two, at least, to still come into your diocese. You know? yeah. well, I'm glad you're here. And uh, encourage everybody, too, to pray for our bishops as well. Yes, yes please. Uh, yes, please do that. Very important. Mm-hmm. And, Bishop, would you would you mind closing us in prayer? Certainly. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being called to share your life. We thank you that you call us to share your grace at work in us. Help us to recognize the opportunities that come before us to truly speak and live in such a way that we are the salt and light that we are called to be. We pray for all who are listening, all who benefit from this ministry. May they come to know your love and mercy and reflect it in their love for others. And may Almighty God bless you and the work you do, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop, for being with us. Thank you for connecting with us at the talk show. Make sure that you connect with us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're on all of the audio services, including Podbean, as well as YouTube. So to our patrons out there, thank you for the support of the show. If you're considering becoming a patron of the show, go to www.catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon, and we've got some great content to send your way, coffee cups, hoodies, and all sorts of essential oils from Jordan. Oh, yeah, we'll see if we work we're gonna, those We're going to get a tier of uh, essential oils and candles. And uh, it's great to connect in the Catholic Church through all of these wonderful tools and this tool itself. So God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.